Hello and welcome to Emma's ESL English. We are on day two of our International Women's Day readings. Don't worry, today's is substantial. They basically get shorter with each reading. <laughs> Jane Goodall's was the longest. This one's a little bit shorter. The next one's a little bit shorter again. Um, they're all equally important and I think they all have uh, equally valuable and interesting perspectives. And also I think for our times, for the struggles that we're facing now, I think they're relevant. That's why I'm reading them. <laughs> so this one today is from uh, Rennie Delorte's book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to, Black to White People About Race. This book, as it says, it was a Sunday Times bestseller. It it flew off the shelves and um, it started because Rennie wrote um, a blog article, her own blog. She wrote a piece. This was literally the title of the piece, basically saying, I'm done. As a black woman, I'm done talking to white people about race. It's not worth it. And that started a whole new conversation about why was she done with it? <laughs> Shouldn't she? It's her job, right? Surely it is. Um, it's not for the record. So this is really, it's a really interesting book. It's a really interesting topic. I think it's a really relevant topic, especially with generally racism around the world, I think is a problem. Of course, in America, it's a, a life challenging problem. Literally people are dying because of the color of their skin. That is ludicrous. But again, it happens around the world it's a problem. So that's why I wanted to read something from this book for you on this International Women's Day. Um, if you are more interested in the book, <clears throat> I will put a link in the blog. There is a video of Emma Watson having a conversation with Renee about this book. So of course you can go read the book. If you don't want to read the book, you can go read the blog. It's a lot shorter, uh, but too long for this episode. Um, or alternatively, just go watch the video with Emma Watson, which is a really interesting conversation. So today, <laughs> in a world where blunt, obvious acts are just the tip of the iceberg of racism, we need to describe the invisible monolith. Now, racism can be found in the way a debate is framed. Now, racism can be found in coded language, attacking racist frame, form, functions and codes with no words to describe them can make you feel like you're the only one who sees the problem. We need to see racism as structural in order to see its insidiousness. We need to see how it seeps like a noxious gas into everything. In a conversation about structural racism, a friend of mine once made a, po a point that was both glaringly obvious and painfully elusive. Structures, she said, are made out of people. When we talk about structural racism, we're talking about the intensification of personal prejudice, prejudices of group think. It is rife. But rather than deeming the current situation an absolute tragedy, we should seize it as an opportunity to move towards a collective responsibility for a better society. Taking account of the international hierarchies and intersections along the way. It doesn't have to be like this, and the solution starts with us. Racism's cultural reach is so pervasive that we must take up the mantle of changing our workplaces and social circles ourselves. Often in these conversations, someone will pipe up to say, in order to win, we need unity. But I think that if we wait for unity, we'll be waiting forever. People are always going to disagree about the finer points of progress. Waiting for unity is just inviting inertia. So a word to those who feel the weight of racism, who keenly feel the effects of how it suffocates kindness and generosity and potential, how it is slowing down the world we live in. We cannot escape the legacies of the past, but we can use them to model our future. The late Terry Pratchett once wrote, there's no justice, just us. I can't think of any other phrase that best sums up the task ahead. It's on your shoulders and mine to dismantle what we once accepted to be true. It's our task. It needs to be done with whatever resources we have on hand. We need to change narratives. We need to change the frames. We need to claim the entirety of British history. 
we need to let it be known that black is British, that brown is British, and that we are not going away. We can't wait for a hero to swoop in and make things better, rather than be forced to react to biased agendas. We should be outright we should outright reject them and set our own. Most importantly, we must survive in this mess, and we do that any way we can. If you are disgusted by what you see, and if you feel the fire coursing in your veins, then it's up to you. You don't have to be the leader of a global movement or a household name. It can be as small scale as chipping away at the warped power relations in your workplace. It can be passing on knowledge and skills to those who wouldn't have access, who wouldn't access them otherwise. It can be creative. It can be informal. It can be your job. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as you're doing something. Yes, I agree. Uh, okay, cool. So there's quite a few idioms in there. There was quite a few, uh, Rennie's British, so it's not surprising there's quite a few um, British words and phrases in there too. So don't forget, I will put those in the blog. You'll be able to check them out and get a more detailed understanding um, of what those mean if you had trouble getting your head around them during the reading. Okay, have a great day. I will see you next time. Bye.